Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. And I'm gonna talk about peak oil supply, which is basically an oil crisis. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. And I don't know if we are ever going to get to an oil supply crisis. We might have demand get cut for oil before this even happens. I, I, this is just a thought experiment. And I, and I want it to be almost as a stress test to your portfolio. And I, I've changed the way I've invested based off of the paradigm I'm describing here. It doesn't mean I'm driven by this 100%, but it's in the back of my head. Uh, it has been when I was a little kid. And it, it, this is where it started. I was 12 years old, and I asked my dad, Dad, how do we fill up all of these cars with gasoline? Because I see cars all the time, all over the place, and everyone's filling up, you know, 10, 20 gallons of, of fuel in their car. How is it possible that we have this much gasoline? And he just said that we have a bunch of oil in the world and that we haven't hit the limits or something on the lines of that. <clears throat> and it's always been in the back of my mind. So I'm going to talk about peak oil supply and the ramifications uh, of it. And I'm going to tie it to declining ore grades, the, the exponential increase in energy growth for copper production <clears throat> because of declining ore grades. And I'm going to tell you that the problem is not going to be visible because it's exponential. It's not linear. So when you have a problem that's coming at you, it's very difficult to see if it's an exponential format versus a linear format. An exponential format means that you start here and it ramps up very substantially. Linear means that you take this nice, smooth, linear progression higher. I'm going to try to explain it as best I can, and I'm going to pull up an Excel spreadsheet to try to describe it. I'm going to zoom in here, and this is, this is exponential growth. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work backwards. Uh, it's very easy, or, or it's much harder to understand working from forwards, going forwards up, much easier to understand going from a, a, a peak down. Now, I don't know where this peak is at. I don't claim to know where it's at. I'm not claiming a time frame. I'm not claiming anything. What I want you to get out of this is the difficulty to... Uh, the difficulty to see something that's expanding at an exponential rate. And an exponential rate means that it's anything that's growing at a percentage basis, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%. Those are all exponential increases. And if you're going to double production of something and you're growing at exponential speeds, it means that your production is going to be growing at greater and greater quantities over time. Because 2% of a small number is a lot less than 2% of a very large number. So you have to grow at ever greater quantities going forward. So my question is this. Do you think we can increase the production of oil, the entire production today, do you think we could double it? I don't think we can. I think if we're growing oil consumption, by a few percent per year. Uh, I can just do a quick calculation here to show you what I'm talking about. So let's say we are at one. We're at, this is a 100%, which is where we are at today. <clears throat> and we're going to multiply it by 2%. So that's one year, two year, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So in 20 years, we're going to increase oil production by about 50%, 48.6%. In that production, do you think we can increase our production by 48.5%? I don't think so. I don't think we can, can increase production uh, to 150, 160 million barrels per day. 150 probably is about where it would be. I don't think we can go that much. So I don't think we have 20 years left of oil. Um, we, we probably have less than 10. So this is going to hit us in less than 10 years, potentially, potentially. Now, if you look at what I have here, I started 100% max production 
I don't know what that max is at. But if we were to go backwards from max production backwards, could we see this actually coming? And each doubling, going, you know, cutting it in half, going backwards, is what you're going to look at. So if you're one doubling away, and let's say a doubling is 10 or 20 years, I don't know what the percentage is that we're growing of oil. I just made up 2%. Uh, it could be more than that. But let's say we're doubling it in 20 years. We could have a 20 years to look at this and we say, oh, we still have you know 50% more upside to max production. But that's really only one doubling. Now, if you go one, two, three, four, five doublings back, you're at 3% production of your max production. Four doublings back is six. Three, uh, four, yeah. One, two, three doublings back is you're at 13% of your total production. And two doublings back, you're only at 25%. And everyone would think you have absolutely no problem. Now, what if we are closer to max produc production than what we think? What if we're only a few years away? What if we've already hit it? I, I don't know. Remember, I don't know when max production is, but we, we can't really see this when these we've got these big exponential moves. It's difficult to put it to pinpoint the top. So we could be anywhere around it in the next 10, 10 20 years, or maybe even less than five years. I, I don't know the exact amount. I'm just saying it's difficult to recognize when this peak will be. Now, what's the ramifications of a peak in oil production. So here is uh, oil production. I'm just going to move me up here out of the way so you guys can see this. Here's oil production on the right hand side here. They have a potential peak in 2020. I don't know if this is right. Uh, this is the oil supply. We're coming on up. The yellow is the actual. And these were some estimates of an 05 peak, a 2010 peak, a 2020 peak. And I don't know where this peak is at. I, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not claiming it. But if it is somewhere close to here, what is the ramifications on your investments if this were to, to come true? And it could potentially happen in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. How would you want to position yourself and your portfolio for this to happen? And in my opinion, uh, there's certain ways to look at your investments, uh, whether it be for your kids or for yourself, that might better prepare you or them for the future of this inevitability. And hopefully this doesn't happen, but I, I don't necessarily see how it doesn't happen. Now I'm going to talk about declining ore grades. Uh, we've got copper here. This is the average copper ore head grades. And over time, we are declining. Ore grades are declining over time. And if you look at 2020 to 2025, which is relatively flat, uh, it's around 0.53% ore grade for copper. And what I get worried about is if I'm going to invest in a copper producer, their new projects are probably going to be below 0.53%. Because if this is trending lower, it means that You've got an average. This is an average. That means there's a bunch that are over it and there's ones that are below it. If we're below it, if all the new projects are below 0.53%, how much energy is this going to take? Are we going to ramp exponentially on energy? Now, if you tie this with the peak oil I just showed you, if this is about to decline or if it's going to get tough to extract more oil, how is that going to impact our investments, our long term investments? in mineral companies. What kind of impact is it going to have on our portfolio if oil prices uh, were to go drastically higher? And this isn't just a problem of price. This is a problem of energy availability, of a scarcity. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to happen. Remember, I don't know the timing of this. I'm just saying, what if? It's a what if thought experiment. So if this were to happen, what we would see is that we would be drilling in deep seas to get this oil. We would be extracting it out of oil sands and shales. We would be going to declining energy return on energy invested areas to extract this stuff. 
And are we extracting it from those areas? The answer is yes. We're probably already there. Now, this is the volume of billions of barrels. It's not the energy that is available to society. Now, if we have energy available to society declining faster than this because we are going to lower energy return on energy invested barrels of oil, shale, tar sands, deep sea, on and on, then this is going to decline more rapidly uh, for energy to society to be used to do mining, to do whatever we want, to do technology, to, to scroll on your phone and watch YouTube channels. So I'm, I'm trying to tie this all together. We've got this energy oil problem. And again, governments may mask this as an environmental climate change problem that we need to drastically move to a, an electric uh, emissions-free society because maybe this is the driver of it, potentially. So we've got these declining ore grades in copper. Here is another... Uh, chart it's the energy intensity so what happens here is as the ore grade continues to decline and goes from the right to the left <clears throat> and we get under 0.5 remember that 0.5 that i was talking about the average copper ore grade from this guy here we're at 0.53 percent for average the new stuff's all below it we have an exponential increase in energy intensity when we go below 0.5 and look how this ramps higher this is exponential as you get to 0.25. I mean, it is a big, basically turning the curve, hockey stick energy consumption. So I'm looking at, we've got declining ore grades. They're declining towards a, a critical point of 0.5%. We have a, an exponential move higher in energy intensity, which means we're going to have an exponential growth in energy use at the same time that we potentially could have a decline in energy from oil. Not a good mix, not, not a good mix. Now, how can we improve this? This is cumulative energy demand, sorry for the quality of this, but technology can improve this curve by shifting it a little bit lower, but not too much. It doesn't change the look of this curve. So if you're declining in ore grades, it'll change it a teeny bit, but not a huge amount. So I don't think technology can necessarily save us. Economies of scale can also bring this down. But everything we're finding is over here. We don't have this stuff over here anymore. So the exhaustion and increasing supply is moving down this ore grade and up this cumulative energy demand. And this is, this is true of anything that is extracted from the earth. We are all moving towards more energy consumption. At the same time, we are finding lower and lower energy sources. The quality and returns of the energy that we're finding is going down. This is not a good mix. And here's the total energy and tons of copper produced for all of Chilean mines. So the total energy is this dark line, and we're moving up and up and higher. And if you notice, the tons in copper and the energy, total energy, is getting a larger and larger gap over time. And this only goes to 2013, which means that we are dumping more and more energy into it, and the tons of copper produced are not as great. So on an energy per ton basis, we are consuming more energy per ton of copper over time. So not only do we see that we're going after harder and harder to get oil, we're seeing that the energy per ton is increasing over time. We've got our, our verification here. And if we're going after lower return oil, and basically I'm mainly focusing on oil. If we're going after lower returns in oil, and we're getting less back, of energy to use in society, these guys are consuming it more and more. They're going to they're gonna take a larger and larger lump of what we need. They're going to they're gonna take more demand of, of what's available to mine these materials. And a general, very easy to look at um, graph here is decreasing ore grades result in an increasing energy input, which is, which is both 
logarithmically approaching zero with de declining or grades, and we are asymptotically uh, approaching some value where it doesn't matter what you do. You hit a certain or grade, you're going to be dumping an exponential amount of energy to get it. It's basically uneconomical or not even economical. It'd be from an energy perspective, you hit a, a dead a, a wall. You can't produce it irrespective of how much money it is. It's, it's, it, it's just not worth the, the efforts. Now, here is the problem. Copper is not being discovered fast enough to be mined uh, to meet upcoming demand. We've got the primary demand right here in the black line going up. We have the base production capability in the dark, kind of the lighter green, and then the dark greens, the probable projects. We have a 10 million ton deficit out by maybe 2030, 2029. If we have a problem in oil and whatever is on the other side of our solution has to run through copper, how is this all going to play out? We don't have the, the projects in the pipeline to meet the copper demand. And if we want to ramp up dramatically our electrical consumption because of renewables and because of electric vehicles and the demand for electricity is going to increase quite substantially, we don't have the copper in the pipeline, the projects to do it. And I don't know if there is enough copper projects to hit the we'll call it the demand per year we have enough copper in the ground i don't know if we can flow that copper fast enough to meet demand produce it fast enough so we have that aspect now we also have world silver extraction silver is a byproduct of some of these mining materials something like copper something like zinc if copper is declining if we don't have those projects in the mix and silver is a byproduct of those productions. Silver production may go down. Now, here's world silver extraction. They got the peak around 2030, something on the lines of that. That's probably pretty close. So that is something also to take into consideration. Is that gold, and I don't have the extraction here of gold. Actually, maybe I do. Here's world copper and gold annual production and forecasts. Uh, a lot of people are forecasting that gold has already hit a peak in production. Silver is a byproduct of gold production. Silver is a byproduct of copper production. Silver is a byproduct of all these minerals that are being produced. And copper, they have being somewhere the here, they have it around 2018, 2019, 2020 as being a peak in, in declining. So we may see peak silver production as well if we have peaks in these. And I'm not claiming the tops here. I don't necessarily know. If you take a very long-term picture uh, on all of this, you can maybe develop a strategy, an investment strategy. And I'll go over what that strategy is in my opinion. Here is platinum. This is global platinum production in the red. The yellow is the global palladium production. Notice in 2006, it was basically a peak here for both metals. And we've been declining ever since. Is it price related? Maybe, maybe not. Palladium's gone up quite a bit. Rhodium's gone up quite a bit. And platinum's been a laggard. But you would think that they would produce all of them in this basket if they all come out of the ground together. They've been in decline. Now, here's a, a more recent one for South Africa. So South Africa produces 80% of platinum group metals, roughly. Uh, this is Af South African platinum output in, in gradual decline. We've got the peak output in 2006, just like we have here, peak output in 06, and it's been declining ever since. We are seeing peak production in some of these minerals. Gold, potentially silver, potentially copper, potentially platinum, in all these things. Now here is uranium world uranium extraction we still have some upside on uranium we still have some upside from 2020 we can go all the way to about 20 late 2030s mid 2030s somewhere in there uh, if we want to produce more uranium which i think we are going to have to now 
I'm going to talk here, and again, this is just a thought experiment. How, what impacts does this have on our investments? When I was researching peak oil a long time ago, uh, what we were going to see at the top is we're going to see an increase in, in price of oil, but not a huge increase in production or supply as a response. And as oil gets too expensive, it's going to crash the economy. And we're going to see violent crashes and, and up, up and downs, basically, as oil depletes. So if we see a depleting oil production uh, and supply of oil, I think we're going to see massive movements of, of crashes, fall down, come back up, crash, and we'll, we'll repeat over and over and over uh, over time. And over that time, we're going to have declining energy uh, to do work in society. That's, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have declining work in society. And that declining work in society is going to have an impact on mining in general. So mining is going to have to go to a solar, uh, renewable energy based if it can. And the declining ore grades it is going to be rough. And if we go to this new renewable energy world, we're going to have to cross through silver and platinum and copper. We're going to have to have these minerals. They are, they are going to be the bridge from today till tomorrow. So I think all of those are good investments. And the way that I'm viewing it is I'm taking physical metals, physical silver, physical platinum, because of the utility to society. If silver is the number two commodity in its uses, that means it has great utility to society. If we have a shortage in silver, and that has one of the most and greatest utilities to society, and it has a monetary aspect to it, I think silver is a great investment. Physical silver, like taking delivery of the physical metal. I also like royalty companies because if your energy inputs go up, as long as they are continuing to produce, doesn't matter what the margins are of the mining companies, the price and volume is all we care about in a royalty company. So I think royalty companies are also a pretty good bet for a risk-adjusted return, a good return. The physical metal. So if you look at my portfolio, I try to get twenty to thirty percent physical metals. I know that sounds crazy. I, a, a house, thirty percent, and then the rest is investments. All sorts of different types of investments, and and right now I like mining companies. Now. I just presented all this, and I think it's going to happen over the next 10, 15, 20 years. I think some of it is already happening. You can see the declining ore grades. You can see us going after lower quality oil. It's all in front of our face. It's all right there. You can look at it. I'm not trying to make anything up. It's, it's in our face right there. So that's why I've pushed so much into the physical metals, because if the future of energy is scarcer than what we can produce, if we think and this is a perception. If humans think, if investors think that the energy is more scarce tomorrow than it is today, what potentially could happen is hyperinflation in, in, in countries because all of this debt is predicated off of growth. And if that growth doesn't materialize because of energy constraints, all currencies go to zero. The stock market is predicated off of future growth. If future energy, energy supplies are perceived as, as a problem, we are going to what? Crash the stock market because it's based off of price to earnings. That's You're paying a very large multiple for future growth. If that future growth, the energy isn't there to have that future growth, then they need to be drastically priced lower. Everything's predicated off of growth and growth is predicated off of energy. And if energy is, is in scarcer amounts in the future, then that growth will never materialize and everything's overvalued. That's, that's the thought process. So metals in your hand, if we're going into peak production, if we are, the metals in your hand are going to be the most valuable thing in the world then. Because you have the physical metal that has the utility to society, the, the value to society that everybody wants, and you have it in your hand above the ground, and that energy's already been sunk into it, and you purchased it at a ratio that was 
as low as you can possibly find. The only thing that can that can unwind all this is if we found another uh, very cheap high energy return energy source. And I don't know if it's out there. And remember, all the solutions have been things that we have to mine out of the ground. So the bridge from today till tomorrow has to go through some minerals. Those minerals, in my opinion, are probably either going to be, and it could be a basket approach, which I think is going to happen. A hydrogen economy, platinum's the winner. And silver's the winner. Silver's the winner in a battery electric vehicle economy like that, if it's a battery type based. But I don't think we can mine all these batteries. So then I think <clears throat> it's going to be platinum, silver, and copper. Copper has to be used everywhere because that's what is 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 the connection of all this electricity it's it's the it's the connection between everything so silver copper platinum as minerals tin's another one that's going to be really good too and if we hit a constraint in minerals if we can't mine all this stuff what is the most energy dense source that we can get electricity from nuclear power which is uranium and all of these opportunities on a ratio basis are the cheapest they've ever been. The cheapest they've ever been in relationship to other assets. I have never been this excited for this opportunity to buy things at a hundred year lows in relationship to stocks and other assets that has a setup as, as obvious and as insane as this. So I've taken the approach of acquiring physical physical like in your hand metals that you can you can take on delivery and i'm investing in royalty companies to reduce my risk because they are diversified by nature and they're they're putting their they're getting revenues from many different sources and remember there is a lot of risk i think going out 10 20 30 years not because of the energy declines not because of the ore grades but because countries are going to start to figure out how valuable these minerals are. And if energy becomes more scarce, then the minerals themselves are gonna become a lot more valuable. And I think you're gonna start seeing nationalization of mines and other things. So I'm taking a big physical metals approach because of monetary reasons and because of scarcity reasons and energy, you know, energy scarcity and mineral scarcity. And then I'm taking a royalty approach, which is a diversified, each company is diversified by a, having a whole bunch of different royalties, and it takes out the inflation risk from oil, and it's just volume and price. That's kind of my strategy and plan. That's me. Now, I if we're just in a regular commodity bull market and oil can be increased much more so, I still win. It's a win-win scenario that I'm in. Now, if energy becomes more scarce, then I will also be in a win. So it's a win-win. I get to win any, any way I, I, I work at, or I look at this. And the physical metals are the highest risk adjusted returns. Risk adjusted means the risk is very low in them and the returns can be pretty high. So risk adjusted, I think that's probably one of the best bets. You don't have any risk for nationalization. You don't have any risk and all these other things that could happen. Inflation risk from oil, you know, the oil, oil input costs and the cost curves moving up on you. Royalties, royalty companies and physical metals don't have that, that risk. If you guys like this content, please give me a thumbs up. Leave comments below if you have any comments. And thank you for listening. This is Finding Value.